All right, we're ready, Sarah. If you can just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Denise, for inviting me to do this uh, conversation today. Um, as Denise said, my name is Sarah Donovan. Um, I am a social worker by training. That's my identity first and foremost, I would say. Um, and then I teach social work in um, the Department of Social Work at App State. And I, I primar primarily teach our foundational courses. So students that are kind of just getting into the social work profession, um, which I really love because I think um, my passion for social work, it can be fairly contagious. So hopefully that, that translates well in terms of um, getting students excited about our profession. Um, but my practice before I started teaching has been primarily with the Latinx Spanish speaking immigrant community, um, both here in the high country region of North Carolina, as well as in um, the Durham area of North Carolina. Um, interestingly, I, I did essentially the exact same job here in Boone um, as I then and later did in Durham. Um, and so that was a very fascinating experience to do uh, a home visiting program with Latinx families um, in a very rural community like ours, and then to go and do that same exact work in a much more urban setting um, where families of immigrants were much more well established. So that was an interesting sort of juxtaposition at looking at um, working with immigrants in this community, especially when I first started in 2000 six, um, our Latinx immigrant community was still pretty much brand new in terms of families really getting established and, and growing that community. Um, so yeah, it was a very interesting uh, experience to, to do that work in these two different communities. Um, but I have also done some other types of work with Latinx families. Um, most recently, before I started teaching full time, I worked for the Gear Up program. So if you're not familiar with that, it's a college access program through the university. Um, the Gear Up Appalachian Partnership here serves um, 11 counties. And my responsibility with that program was primarily to um, design and implement programming that was targeted towards Latinx immigrant youth and their families to try to get um, young people thinking about, excited about, and prepared for college or some type of post-secondary education. Um, we were very, you know, we, we really tried to push community college as a great option, um, not just four-year institutions. Sure. So, um, and I'm excited to announce on a side note that Gear Up just got their grant renewed. So they're gonna, the, the first grant that we had that we have been working on was a seven year grant that was designed or designated to end this year. Um, and they just got word that they're renewed for another seven years, I believe, which is fantastic news for our community. Um, also, similarly, the first group of students who we served through Gear Up way back when they were middle schoolers are now freshmen um, in college. And we have a number of Gear Up students at App State, which is very exciting as well to see that come full circle. And quite a few of the students that are served by Gear Up are Latinx. So it, it certainly connects to the topic that we're discussing today. Um, but let me just uh, say a few words. Well, let me, I'll say this first. Um, this is a topic that I love to talk about. My practice experience, my research, um, my service has all been centered around working with the Latinx immigrant community. So I could definitely drone on for a very long time um, and that might get very boring. So if I, you know, at any point, if you want to interject a question, I'm totally fine with that. Um, and I will try to, to stop talking in enough time that we can have a nice conversation and some back and forth. I would really primarily love to hear what, what your questions are as practitioners and community members and educators here in the high country. What are the questions that you have? How do you see um, our immigrant neighbors being affected um, within your role, within your work? So, and I would love to just have some conversations and address some of those questions that you have. So, um, so in terms of thinking about trauma, I think the place that we have to start with immigrant communities is acknowledging that the trauma is often um, multifaceted and it, the trauma often occurs at different points of the migration process. It's not just, um, you know, being mistreated at the border or being, um, threatened by gangs during the, the transition from the country of origin through Mexico or um, whichever route that a person is taking. I mean, there are 
often multiple layers of trauma. And so we have to think about the trauma in terms of the trauma that occurred before a person decided to migrate because nine and a half times out of 10, there's something traumatic that's happened that's pushed them out of their country of origin. People don't just leave everything they know, take this perilous journey um, and come to the United States for no reason or just for funsies. You know, it, it's truly, there's always gonna be some sort of significant push factor that pushes them out. And, and generally speaking, there's trauma involved with that. Oftentimes it's violence. Um, it could be domestic violence of some type. It could be gang violence. Um, one of the number one reasons that we see, um, especially younger people, but really people of all ages coming from Central America towards the United States right now is because of threats from gang violence. Um, so a lot of times what will happen, for example, is um, a young person will be recruited by a gang. And if they refuse to join that gang, they will often be persecuted themselves personally or family members. Um, oftentimes people have to pay, um, um, oh my gosh, what's the word in Spanish is multa, but the word in English is like um, penalties of some kind or like a, I don't, I don't know what the word is, but uh, they have to pay a gang in order to continue operating their business within gang territory. Um, and if they can't afford to pay that, Denise, you look like you had a word for that. What was it? <laughs> I said protection money. Yeah, I mean, it's basically like protection money. So the gang will leave them alone and allow them to continue living or operating their business in that particular neighborhood. Um, and if people can't afford to pay it, then then they face violence. And, um, you know, that often goes south very quickly and results in, you know, rape, murder, all kinds of horrible things. Um, I also think it's really important and we don't really have time today to get into like the full backstory. Um, but I just think it's so important that we always acknowledge the intricacies and how interconnected U.S. policy is with all of these things that are happening in Central America that are forcing people to come fleeing to the United States. Um, the majority of the gang activity that is so threatening right now in Central America um, is a result of gangs forming in the US, primarily in our criminal justice system in jails and prisons. Um, and then those people who have joined these gangs because of how often how ostracized and not included they were in American culture, society, economies, um, those people are then deported and they take the gang with them. And so that most of the gangs that are the most dangerous and most active in Central America at this time are actually gangs that were formed in the US that we exported essentially to those countries. Um, so again, I, I, it's just so important to understand those policy implications of immigration um, practices here in the US and how that affects and, and also how we haven't done a very good job of responding to those crises that are happening um, in Central America and certainly not under the current administration. We've just sort of blown the problem up. Um, we'll talk about that maybe in just a minute, but I get, okay, so thinking about trauma um, before the journey, again, that has forced someone into this position of feeling like they have no other choice but to leave everything they've ever known behind and go on this perilous journey. Um, you know, many people are familiar with the journey from seeing, um, you know, pictures of caravans on the news. Um, and yes, there are people who, who make this journey um, from Central American countries or from Southern Mexico um, in a caravan in that, in that manner. But there are lots of people who do it very differently. Um, there are people who pay coyotes, which is the word that's used for basically human smugglers um, to bring them through Mexico and across the border. There are people who travel alone on top of um, rail, on top of freight trains. Um, hundreds, if not thousands of people are injured or killed every year on freight trains because of how dangerous it is, obviously, to ride on top of a train that is moving very fast. Um, and jumping on and off the train is a very dangerous proposition. People lose limbs all the time, unfortunately, um, in that process. Um, so again, just thinking about trying to think back to how significant a person's trauma has to be to make them choose to go on a journey like that, to know that that's what they're facing is this kind of peril. Um, something very, very dramatic is pushing them out of their home country and making them choose this option. 
generally speaking. Um, now, I, I also think it's important to note that I have known a lot of families who came um, to the United States on a travel visa, on a tourist visa. Um, so they literally flew on an airplane and got here, obviously before COVID, but um, you know, people will come through a, a tourist visa, which are difficult to get, but with the right resources, some people can get them. Um, and then they'll overstay that visa. Uh, so, but I, but I think it's important to recognize that those, those people who come that way are gonna often have trauma too. It's not just the people who have taken this perilous journey, you know, walking hundreds of th or thousands of miles through the desert um, or through Mexico and then through the desert to cross the border. It, yes, that is trauma, but even the people who came, you know, on an airplane are still experiencing significant trauma. Um, just the idea again of leaving behind everything you know, coming to an unknown country where oftentimes you don't speak the language, you don't know the customs, um, you don't know how to get basic access to medical care, um, those kinds of things. So again, there are so many of these layers of trauma that occur. Um, and then you think about the trauma that occurs once a person has arrived um, and they are now in this foreign land. Um, you know, most people that I have had the pleasure to work with who are immigrants came to this area. You know, when we think about Boone, North Carolina, like why do people end up in Boone, North Carolina of all places? And we could talk, you know, about the um, industries here that have that have attracted people. The Christmas tree, obviously, industry is one. Um, but but generally speaking, people end up in a certain place because they have connections. So um, there was a handful of brave families that came here first, and then they have family members that followed suit and came to this particular location because they had friends or family who are already at least somewhat established here and could help them navigate that process. Um, so in terms of resiliencies, I think that's a really important note to bring up, right, is that these informal networks of support that exist are everything to many of our immigrant families. Um, the support they receive from extended family, um, you know, friends that they knew from, you know, 20 years ago back home, uh, it's, it's, you know, really kind of a beautiful thing to see how these communities form, um, you know, even people who didn't really know each other in their home community, when they're in this situation of feeling so removed from everything that is familiar and supportive, um, to have someone who at least is familiar in terms of understanding their culture and their language and their practices, um, that is really an important uh, resiliency that, that I have seen a lot I've seen that be very beneficial to a lot of families. Um, so one thing that I want to mention as well is in terms of thinking about trauma and how people who have experienced migration related trauma work through it, um, there's this concept. So there was an article that was written in 2016, I believe, by Mark Lusk and Felisa Galindo who um, work at the University, University of Texas in El Paso. Um, and they wrote this article about um, testimonies of the migration. So they spent about eight years um, interviewing people at the border. They do a lot. Uh, I know I know Mark. Mark does a lot of border work. Um, and he has worked with a lot of immigrants who are just arriving, just coming across the U.S. border um, and has done a lot of interviews with a lot of different folks and tried to understand their experience. And um, one of the things that they have found is just giving people an opportunity to share their testimonial, to share their story of what's happened to them is tremendously empowering. Um, a lot of people don't even recognize the significance of their trauma until they've had a chance to verbalize that. Um, and for many people, just being able to say it out loud and have someone who can, you know, respect that and hear it and not be um, completely appalled or shut down by it. I mean, that in and of itself can be amazingly resilience building just to have someone who can sit and, and I don't want to use the word take the trauma, but essentially, you know, take the trauma to hear that horrific, what is often a horrific experience um, and not be repulsed by it or shut down by it. Um, that experience of feeling heard, uh, it, a lot of people in this study recognize that as something that was very valuable to them, just being able to share their testimony. Um, 
I want to read a short passage. Sarah, yes. if you tell me those people's names again, I can type them in the chat for you. Sure. Um, Mark. Yeah. And I'm also, uh, Denise, I have a um, reading list that I put together that I can drop the link. It's a Google Doc that everyone should have access to, I think, if I did it right. Um, and I can drop that in the chat. But their names are Mark Lusk, L-U-S-K, and Felisa Galindo. I, I, I'll actually type that one if that's okay, because it's kind of yep. hard to spell. Perfect. Thank name. you. Felisa Galindo um, and Mark Lusk. So yeah, but that that reading um, is on the reading list that I'm happy to share if, if people are interested. Um, let's see. So I'm going to read a quick passage um, from that article because I think this is really powerful. It says, I need my glasses. The Latin American testimony has common attributes regardless of genre. The testimonio or testimony gives voice to the powerless. It is an authentic narrative told by a witness. It's driven by the urgency of a situation such as war or violence, is a form of popular discourse, and it seeks to denounce the present situation. It includes a call for action to rectify a perceived injustice. The testimonial has roots in the narratives of slaves and other subordinated peoples, such as the indig indigenous people of the Americas. It can be described as a subversive form of literature in that it seeks to rewrite and correct Latin American history. So I think what that speaks to for me in terms of thinking about um, helping people be resilient through their trauma is this idea that so many of the people that are coming to the United States from Central American regions. The, the, the migrants who are ending up here in our communities as our neighbors um, often have very indigenous roots, right? They're, they're often not necessarily primarily of Hispanic origin. Um, oftentimes their roots are more related to indigenous communities. In fact, we have a number of people ending up in our community who, who don't even speak Spanish as their first language. There are other indigenous languages that are represented here, um, especially as we've seen more families coming from Guatemala and Honduras um, and Southern Mexico. That's even more true now. But um, in particular, I, yeah, I want to just, I think it's important to think about how these um, testimonies that people can provide give them that voice back give them that power because their people their history is so interconnected with um, being colonized being forced into um, subordinated positions not having a voice of any kind and so dr lusk and, and dr galindo talk about how um, providing space for people to tell their testimonial gives them back that power it sort of um, not that it, can, it could ever undo the hundreds of years of, of uh, marginalization and subordination that their people have experienced, but it is very much empowering for people to be able to say, this is my story. And even if it doesn't fit with the popular narrative around migration or how my people have been treated, this is still my truth. This is still my story. Um, and I think that that is incredibly important. I'm gonna pause there and see if anyone has questions before I move on by and talk about a couple other things. And so you're welcome to type them in the chat, but you're also welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Sarah, I really like your point that how multi-layered it is and how it's not just one aspect, that it begins as early as the, you know, whatever experiences you're having in your country of origin. And then in every, phase of the journey, even after you arrived here, you're continuing to experience trauma. So um, when we talk about um, traumatic experiences and how they pile on each other and increase their impact exponentially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you start talking about several different types of traumatic experiences, you're increasing all the negative impacts of health and mental health and all of those things. So that was a really good reminder. Um, and I see you put the um, Google Doc of the reading list in the chat. Thank you for doing that. Sure. I'm also going to drop one more thing in the chat right now before I forget. Um, this is a Vimeo link to a short um, documentary that follows a little girl who was separated from her father at the border. Um, he was then promptly deported, not promptly, but was deported um, and she was held in custody in foster care actually in the US for a number of months. And this short video that I've linked here, the Vimeo, um, follows her story uh, of 
basically being incredibly traumatized. She was actually diagnosed with PTSD before she left the United States. However, um, she was provided no treatment whatsoever. And when she arrived home, thank God, by a miracle, she was finally reunited with her parents. I think it's five or six months later. Um, and but she I mean, she's so clearly traumatized by the experience and there are zero mental health services. The, the parents don't even know that she was diagnosed with anything. They were given some paperwork, but it was all in English. Um, so they really have no clue what's happening other than they can see that their child is completely changed and they'd have no clue how to support her through that. Um, and they acknowledge, you know, we, we just don't know how to help her. We know she's been through this awful thing and didn't have her family there to support her for all these months. And now we don't know, you know, we want to help her, but we don't know what to do. And they interview her teachers at school and different things. It's, um, it's pretty short, but very fascinating and upsetting. Um, and, you know, just a classic example of how trauma affects children um, and makes it really difficult for, for this young child to sort of reacclimate to her home community when she gets back. And for people who don't know, um, if you're a child that's not born in the United States, then you're not eligible for any assistance. So food stamps, Medicaid, HUD. Um, and so if we, when we um, do work with children who weren't born here, it really limits the amount that we can refer to or the ways we can be supportive because it's very, very difficult for them to access any kind of um, supportive or treatment services. So just wanted that, that was always a shock to me and continues to be a shock to me. So just wanted to throw that in there. Well, it's really difficult to help because it there's, that's, there's not that's... really a good way to access things. Yeah. Oh, thanks Candace for doing that. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. It's, and that is one, another aspect of, I think you could even classify as trauma in terms of thinking about the uh, mixed statuses of families. So we have a lot of families who have people of different immigration status. So you might have parents, for example, who are undocumented and have no documentation status. Um, you may have an older child who is undocumented, or if they're fortunate to fit just the right qualifications, they might have DACA. They might have DACA protections, which is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which has thank goodness through court action been fully reinstated at this point. It's been um, in limbo for a while. Um, the Trump administration attempted to um, do away with DACA protections. It was an executive order that was issued by Obama. Um, and so the Trump administration, since it was an executive order, Trump could essentially reverse it. Um, and he attempted to do so, but thankfully the courts intervened and um, made it so that uh, I mean, it was in limbo for a while, so that was hard for a lot of families. Again, these layers of trauma of not knowing what is it, how is this going to turn out? Um, it was, it, anyway, very recently it has, the courts have overturned that. So DACA is fully reinstated for the time being. Um, by all expectations, when the new administration takes over in January, um, that will continue and perhaps even be expanded. Um, in fact, when Obama first uh, instituted DACA at, through an executive order, he then tried a follow-up um, order that would have instituted a new program called DAPA, which was similar to DACA, but for parents of undocumented youth um, or documented children. So basically, if parents were um, had a DACA-mented child or a child who was born in the U.S., they could then potentially qualify for certain protections. Now, I do think it's important to note that DACA um, does not uh, provide a person a legal status per se. Um, it is no. It does not have any path to citizenship or um, or any kind of access to a green card. What it does provide is exactly what it says: is um, deferred action, meaning protection from deportation. They defer any type of deportation action. So a person who is documented, unless they commit a crime, they are essentially protected from deportation. Um, so that's obviously huge relief. Now, in addition to that, in most states, it also entitles a person to get a work permit and a driver's license. That's not true everywhere, but um, in North Carolina, that is true. So a documented youth here can, um, or I say youth, a documented person, um, you have to have arrived in the US when you were a young person, but you cannot apply to DACA until you're at least 16, I believe. I think 
all the way up to like age 35, maybe you can apply for it. Um, so yeah, so um, I forgot, I lost my train of thought. Okay, so DACA um, <laughs> protection, oh gosh, okay. Um, it could have come from me saying they're not eligible for certain services. Yeah, so, oh, so that's one important, yes, thank you. Um, so DACA extends a lot of protections, but it doesn't entitle, again, doesn't entitle people to everything. It doesn't entitle them to citizenship or any kind of path towards citizenship. Um, and it also, uh, oh, thanks, Laura, mixed status families being traumatized. Um, and then DACA also has limitations in terms of educational access. Um, and students who are undocumented um, and documented do not qualify for federal financial aid, for example. Um, they are considered out of state students. So not only do they not qualify for the aid, but they also have to pay the outrageous tuition of out of state, which is really a challenge that is insurmountable for most um, migrant families to overcome. Um, so thinking about uh, mixed status families again, so this idea of um, you have parents who might be undocumented, you have a older child who is undocumented or perhaps documented if they were fortunate to fit all of the requirements for that. And then you may have younger siblings or younger children in the family who are American born US citizens who have full rights and access to you know, Medicaid, food stamps, all the programs that Denise just mentioned, as well as you know, much more opportunity for educational access. So they can qualify for in-state tuition. They can qualify for federal financial aid. Um, there are just so many more opportunities, frankly, for those youth who were just lucky enough to have been born on this side of the border, right? Um, and so the the trauma that comes along with that, I mean, think about sibling rivalry on steroids, right? Like you have this one sibling who doesn't qualify for anything and then younger siblings who, you know, they're not on easy street by any stretch of the imagination necessarily, but they definitely qualify for a lot more. Um, I, I can only imagine it's hard to not have some resentment there um, or as parents to, the difficulty of trying to navigate that in terms of um, knowing that your one child, you know, is cut off from all of these opportunities simply because of where they were born and your other children, you know, potentially have all of these, these additional opportunities. So that was kind of where I was going. Thank you, Laura Birch for um, pointing me back in that direction. You had mentioned at the beginning, Sarah, having some interest in hearing how each of us in our roles um, experience these traumas and things with the populations that we serve. And so somebody had put in there that um, we see the challenge of not all Spanish or Hispanic parents speaking the same dialect. Mm -hmm. So we may use an interpreter to assist us with an evaluation to see if the child is eligible for services. Mm -hmm. And even though we may be using the same language interpreter, the parents still don't understand the interpreter. So that was one thing that someone had put in. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so it could be a difference of, you know, just really strong accent, depending on where the interpreter is from versus where the family is from, or it could be literally a different language. Um, and because there are, like I said before, a number of families who are coming to this area now who speak indigenous languages that aren't, you know, they may speak Spanish as, like roughly as a second language. Um, in fact, I, I can share one example of that. When I worked at the Watauga County Health Department, we had a situation where a woman, um, she only spoke an indigenous language. Her partner, her, her husband or partner um, spoke the indigenous language and Spanish, pretty, somewhat, his Spanish wasn't even that good, but he spoke enough Spanish to communicate. Um, and then the doctor, of course, the provider at the time only spoke English. Um, and so I come into the mix to interpret between the partner's Spanish, broken Spanish into English and from English into Spanish so that he can try to understand and then pass that along to his partner. Um, and the, I mean, this was a situation where um, the, the woman was pregnant and the, the, there was no heartbeat. So it was a really awful, difficult situation. It's something that you want to make sure someone understands what they're hearing, that you know your baby is not alive anymore. Um, and so to be in a situation like that where you're not sure that everyone's getting all of this, that was, that's really hard. And, and again, just thinking back to trauma, like 
the trauma of losing a child, of, you, of losing a baby is enough, but to compound that with, you know, not being able to communicate, communicate fully, not having all that support. I mean, it, it was a really difficult situation. And then the other piece of that that we often see in terms of thinking about communication um, is the parentification of children. You know, we often have children who speak, they, you know, they go to school, so they pick up English much more quickly, um, even if English wasn't their first language. Um, and then to have those children be relied upon heavily, often to be interpreters and translators for their parents, even from, you know, the age of eight, nine, 10, we see young children that are forced into that role um, because it's the best choice. I mean, that's, you know, if the parent doesn't speak any English and the child does, um, th you know, they see that as their best resource to communicate but obviously an eight-year-old doesn't understand medical terms or legal terms, or there's all of these situations um, where people get into a bit of a pickle because a child has misinterpreted. I have seen that happen at Watauga Medical Center. When I went to follow up with a family I worked with, this was a decade ago, but um, the, the child who was probably like 12 had been asked to interpret and had completely misinterpreted what the diagnosis was. Um, and obviously that could have very serious implications um, for the person who was sick. And, and then also for the child who misinterpreted, like how awful would that be if you call someone to, you know, take the wrong medication or, you know, caused your family to lose their home because you didn't interpret something right with the landlord or, you know, there's so much pressure put on these children. That's actually something, I have a, quite a few first generation Latinx students at App State now. Um, I'm really excited that we have a, a large and growing um, community of Latinx students that are interested in social work practice. Um, but what I hear over and over from them is, you know, how stressful it was um, to be that person for their parents growing up, to have to fill out all those forms, to be the, the um, you know, mediator between their parents and everything, basically, because they were the, they were the communication mouthpiece, essentially. Um, and then also on top of that, having to apply for college um, and not having, you know, really any support from family, even though their family oftentimes is very supportive of them going to college, they don't have the skills to help with that. Um, so I think that is uh, something to keep in mind. I've also had a number of, of Latinx students who have confided in me that they have had one or more parents deported, um, either while they were in middle or high school, or even I've had one student recently who had a parent deported while they've been in college. And the trauma of that, of coping with losing your parent and not knowing are they safe are they going to make it back here are they going to have to stay in their country of origin um, also knowing that once a parent's been deported even if they are able to get back here which oftentimes they are um, they have to pay a lot of money so it's a tremendous financial burden but then also that basically precludes them from ever qualifying for any kind of legal status um, so like i have a student that I know right now who um, is also, in addition to all of the other stressors of life, um, is currently applying, she just turned 21. So she is now of legal age, she is a citizen. She's now of legal age to apply for her parents to become green card holders. So she can basically sponsor her parents now that she's 21. Um, so, so also I think it's important to note that the implication there is that her parents have been undocumented in this country for more than 20 years. Um, so just, you know, thinking about the trauma of that and how hard that is to live with that not knowing inconsistency, am I going to be deported, can I drive, you know, all of that for 20 plus years. But now this young person is in this position of trying to apply um, for her parent, one, one parent. So one of her parents was deported. Um, so he will not qualify ever for any kind of legal status. Um, so now she's applying for another parent, her the other parent, um, and just the stress of trying to, to walk that path and figure that out as a 21 year old, knowing that, you know, your family's future in many ways is riding on your shoulders. Like that is unbelievable amount of stress for a college student to have to be dealing with as well. On top of, you know, 
all the other stresses of college, being a first generation college student, et cetera. Um, yeah. So um, thanks for that. It just really broadens up perspective, I think, and um, all the different ways that people can experience trauma. And so one thing I know that it's important for all of us is how do we support, more fully support, what are the ways that you help people um, build, resili build resilience? I know you mentioned just hearing the stories and we've had that before as we've been talking about how do we fully support people from trauma, you know, regardless of the group and that we keep hearing over and over again to be fully present, to be able to be supportive and just be able to sit with, you know, whatever the person needs at the time. So I appreciated that you brought that up just to hear um, you know, the story that they have to share, but are there some other ways that um, you have found to help support people from trauma? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the important thing when we're thinking about migrant communities, which, you know, again, in this area is going to be almost exclusively Latinx. That's not to say that we don't have people from other countries coming here, but um, the majority of our immigrant community in this in this region is from Latin America. Um, and so thinking about supporting Latinx communities, I think it's important to recognize the, the cultural values that, that need to be embraced in that process. So for example, the value of family and the value of community connections are so important. Um, in my experience, I found that support systems or support um, interventions that bring people together in a community format can be really helpful. So like one-on-one -on -one talk therapy may or may not be all that useful to a Latinx immigrant person. Um, I think obviously it's more useful if the provider can relate to that person. So if that person is bilingual and bicultural, I think that helps a lot um, if, if, if it's a person that they feel like they can truly relate to. But in general, I have seen group settings where you have, you know, small groups of people who have a shared experience who can come together and provide that support, that that community aspect can be really powerful for a lot of, of families who have, have gone through a difficult migration experience. I'll also just say we do not have adequate support services for these families in this community, period, end of discussion. Um, for families who do want to get mental health treatment, it is not available here in any sort of meaningful way. Um, and that's not to knock our mental health providers. We have some amazing providers here. We just don't happen to have any um, who are able to provide those culturally appropriate services um, on a sliding scale or um, you know, in a way that people can actually afford to access them. Um, so what we really need in this community, in my opinion, is um, some type of clinic that is really focused on our Spanish speaking community and providing those mental health services to them in a way that's again, cult culturally appropriate, um, and, and the model, if, um, if you're not familiar, there's a, an organization in Durham County um, called El Futuro, which I'll put that name in the chat, um, which means the future, El Futuro. Um, they do mental health services um, specifically for Latinx immigrant families. I mean, they serve other people too, but that's been their primary focus. Um, they have, you know, um, bilingual, bicultural um, people on staff, who do both the services as well as um, administrators. And, um, you know, if you call El Futuro, the person that answers the phone is going to be bilingual um, and be able to help you in English or Spanish. Um, so they really are, in my view, sort of the gold standard for our state. Um, and it's interesting how COVID, you know, all of the complications that it's caused has also opened up some new possibilities. So I know that El Futuro is doing some, um, you know, telehealth kind of stuff. They have actually a connection with, um, I can't remember the name. There's a clinic in Morganton. I should know the name. It's something like Morganton Clinic, but that's not right. Um, <laughs> but there's a clinic in Morganton, North Carolina, which obviously is not far from here. Um, and El Futuro is providing mental health services to clients at that location um, through telehealth. And so it's certainly COVID has introduced to us. I mean, maybe not introduced. I think they were doing some of those services beforehand. But um, now that we're doing so much of our 
lives and our working and our connecting through a screen like we are right now, um, it certainly has demonstrated that that is a possibility. So maybe we don't have the right um, infrastructure here in our small community to create a new location or chapter of El Futuro, but maybe we could you know, have some mechanism for connecting with something like El Futuro and providing services. Um, in fact, it, we, it is a conversation that's ongoing. Um, so I, I work in the Department of Social Work, which is part of the Beaver College of Health Sciences. Um, within our fancy new building over there by the hospital, we have a clinic space um, where we are providing some services. And that certainly has been part of the conversation in terms of thinking about where are there gaps in services in our community? Who, which are communities or population groups that are not getting the kind of services they need? And certainly um, the Latinx immigrant community is um, one of those communities that, that we've identified um, and, and considered, you know, how can we create something in this clinic space to better fill those needs? Because right now they're not, they're not being met. I'm curious, I'd like to hear, I see um, there's something in the chat about La Mesita. I've heard of La Mesita. I haven't um, partnered with them a whole lot, but it's certainly a, a good organization for um, the Immigrant Justice Coalition to look further into because we are looking at, you know, more statewide partners as well as just um, other groups that we could uh, kind of follow their lead or use their model of service provision to expand what, what we're currently doing with the Immigrant Justice Coalition. Um, Michelle Miller from Juvenile Justice said that they've been able to add functional family therapy services for youth and families involved with our office with Spanish speaker providers with, um, I don't know how you pronounce that, if it's AMI kids or AMI kids. Um, awesome. I was going to say something. Oh, you've mentioned the Immigrant Justice Committee a couple of times. Do you mm -hmm. mind to tell people like what y'all's purpose is and when y'all meet in case there's people who want to be more involved with that? Sure. Um, so the Immigrant Justice Coalition is a grassroots community group. Um, and the main focus is on providing opportunities to immigrant community members, which again, in this region is, you know, essentially or primarily Latinx immigrant families. Um, and we do that in a number of ways. Um, it's interesting because it's, a group that's, um, I think, evolved some over the years. Uh, we've worked really hard at having better representation from the Lat Latinx community itself um, on the committee, leadership within the committee. Um, and uh, so that's that's been really exciting to see that, um, you know, commitment of the, the Latinx community to the organization and, and not have it just be a group of well-meaning white people, which is what it was when, when it started. Um, so it's been really nice to have that investment and interest from the community itself. Um, so we've done a number of things. I mean, I, I don't wanna talk too long about IJC, but if people are interested, you can certainly get involved. Um, the next meeting is gonna be in January. We're actually moving our meeting dates from Mondays to Wednesdays because our, interpreter extraordinaire would not be available on Mondays. So we need her. Um, that's one of the things that we've done um, in the past year or so is make sure that all of our meetings are fully bilingual. So anyone who wants to participate, whether they're speaking, you know, if they're a monolingual Eng English or monolingual Spanish speaker, they can be there and participate. Now, there are challenges to that. Um, you know, it basically makes your meetings twice as long when you have to say everything in both languages. Um, so, you, you know, there is some commitment involved, I suppose you could say. Um, let's see, I think our next meeting will be the fourth Wednesday of January, which would be the 27th. Mary, and do you know if that's are, right? Does that sound right? Those that's are what I have written down on my calendar. Okay. Yeah, great, thank you, Mary. And those are virtually, 
Sarah? Those are virtually for now, yes. Pr prior to COVID, we were meeting at St. Luke's. Um, they've been, St. Luke's has been wonderfully supportive of IJC over the years and providing us space for our meetings as well as other events that we've held. Um, so just to give some examples, other things that we've done, we've done a, a couple of um, power of attorney clinics where we had attorneys come and, and do POA documents for um, immigrant families who were concerned about what might happen to their children um, or their property if they were deported. Um, so we've had a number of attorneys that were willing to donate their time to do that for some of our, our community families. Um, we've had, we've partnered with Faith Action to do an ID program, um, which has uh, intersected with the schools. Um, I'm sure Denise has some familiarity with um, the school system accepts those IDs as a valid form of ID, as do the local police department. So that's one of the requirements that Faith Action has before they'll partner with a community organization to bring their ID program. You have to have buy-in from local law enforcement because that's one of the primary goals of the ID is to prevent um, unnecessary detainment and potential deportation of people. So what can happen is if a person doesn't have documents and they're driving without a license, um, they could just get a minor ticket, you know, violation for driving without a license and go about their way. But in some situations, depending on, um, you know, the sort of politics of that community or just that particular um, officer's feelings, that might result in a in um, detaining that person. And once an undocumented immigrant is detained, it's a very slippery slope. Um, they can quickly be put on the radar of ICE and that person could be um, deported before, in, you know, before anything can be cleared up. In fact, that happened to a family that I knew here. It's been a while, it's probably like 15 years ago, but the dad was pulled over for driving without a license. Um, he was arrested because he had the same name as someone who was wanted. Um, it was the wrong person. He was not the person they were looking for, but by the time they realized that it was too late, they had already contacted ICE and he was deported for just not having a license. Um, so it does happen. So essentially the ID program is to make it so that hopefully people won't actually be arrested and, you know, face that potential slippery slope to deportation. Um, they, they can show their faith action ID, proves who they are, um, where they live, and they, that way they can, they can have their name run and make sure that they don't have any outstanding warrants for arrest or anything like that. And then they'll just get a ticket for driving without a license and be able to go about their way. Um, so it doesn't serve as a driver's license, but it does serve as a valid ID that the local law enforcement in Watauga County will accept. Um, so we are very grateful for the partnership of Watauga County Sheriff's as well as Boone PD. Um, that they were willing to, you know, to, to partner with us for that to happen. And in fact, the first um, IJC sponsored Faith Action um, uh, program that we had or clinic that we had for people to come and get their IDs made was the largest that they've ever had. Um, they have Faith Action has done this program all across the state of North Carolina and in much larger areas. But to this day, the one that we had in Boone in 2018, there were over 400 people that showed up to get their IDs, and that was the largest they've ever hosted. Um, and I think there, and here's another interesting piece in terms of thinking about trauma and trust. So the success of that particular ID drive, I think, could very much be credited to the the active participation of a number of immigrant community members who were very involved with, were and many of them still are very involved with IJC. And so they really um, promoted the event, um, made sure that their fellow immigrant community members knew this was a safe thing. It wasn't a trap. You know, you're not gonna put yourself in danger by showing up here. Um, and so we had such a great turn. In fact, we even had some of our immigrant um, committee members in the parking lot so that when people drove up, they would say, hey, you know, is this cool? Is this safe? Can, you know, am I, am I really good to come? And, and they were like, yeah, yeah, it's totally fine. So having that sort of validation from members of the community made it really successful. Unfortunately, the converse, not exactly the converse, but we saw in 2019, what can happen when people start to feel mistrustful. Um, the day before that ID drive, um, President Trump 
tweeted out some sort of veiled threat about ice raids were going to amp up or something like that. And people got really nervous. Um, it, the timing was horrible. It was just terrible timing because because of that tweet. This I, and, and there had been a few ice raids in North Carolina around that time. Um, and so people were just super nervous. And that was enough to make people not show up for that second um, ID drive that was hosted in 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that was really unfortunate. I mean, we had, I think, a hundred and something people came that time, but it was way down from the first one. Um, and so there was a question a little bit earlier about, is there a way to get on an IJC email list? How can somebody do that? Absolutely. Um, the easiest way would be to uh, email me. <laughs> um, I'll drop my personal email in the chat. And if you email me, I'll add you to the list. Thank you. And so um, people are welcome to keep chiming in while we're talking these last few minutes. But one thing that I want you to touch on before we go, Sarah, is how do you promote your own wellness? I think for a lot of us, not only in service professions, but also just in life with people we know who come from trauma or relationships that we're in, we really are trying to focus on staying well. So um, what are some of the ways that you promote wellness in yourself? Um, that is a great question. Um, I would say, I think everyone has to figure out what works for you, right? I mean, in some of his articles, Dr. Lusk talks about compassion fatigue, and that's obviously something that we're, you know, those of us who work in the helping professions are pretty familiar with the idea of compassion fatigue, that it can get really hard. Um, vicarious trauma or secondary trauma is something that we experience, and we have to figure out how to take care of ourselves when that's happening. Um, I, I would argue that I think the sort of counter part to compassion fatigue is compassion satisfaction. So a lot of times, you know, we do what we do as helping professionals or as community members um, who care about our neighbors, we, we invest our time because um, it, it's the right thing to do, but also because it makes us feel good. It makes us feel like we're contributing in some way to a better society, to a better community. Um, and so I think focusing on those successes, the times that you, um, you know, not, not that we should always make it about ourselves. Like I'm not necessarily just giving back to the community because I want to feel good, but it's okay to feel good. And I think you have to embrace that, right? When you know you've done something good to change, you know, to make an impact on someone's life or to help someone, I think it's okay to sit with that for a little while and say, I feel, I feel good about this contribution that I made. Um, and then there's going to be times when I feel really fatigued and, you know, traumatized by the types of involvement I have with, with certain um, experience, people's experiences in the community. But I think it's important to not brush off that feeling of accomplishment, satisfaction, you know, just, just feeling good about having helped someone and being a decent human being. I think that's really important for myself personally, um, in terms of how I promote well-being. I wish I, I could say that I like engage in regular exercise and blah, blah but no, mm -mm, it's definitely not me, but that, but that does work for a lot of people. And I highly recommend exercise, um, or physical activity. I do like to get out and hike and stuff and that does help. But, um, for me, honestly, it's spending time with my family. That sounds cliche, but it's just true. I have two daughters who are eight and 11 and um, they are my reason for everything. And certainly my um, distraction when things get really tough. I, I, we lay down and read together every single night. And for me, that's my chance to kind of like decompress and clear my mind. Um, and so that's my, I would say my main practice for wellness for myself is just making sure that I make that time to appreciate my family um, and do the little things that matter, like laying down to read at bedtime. Yeah, and we, I think we've talked about how self-care has been stereotyped in a lot of our minds as $150 hour long massage, but that it's actually more about perspective and grabbing moments of joy. It doesn't have to cost money or be for a really long time but whatever it is that kind of heals and renews us there are things we just need to make sure we do for our own wellness. So, um, and we've had, had a range from, I had one guy on here one day who listed about, I couldn't even keep up with all the things that he does to keep himself well. 
And then we've had a whole lot of people being like, I don't do it very well and should do it better, which of course is the, you know, we don't want it to be a, a kind of a pressure where you feel like it's one more thing that you're not meeting your obligations. So there's a wide range and continuum of how people engage in wellness. So thanks for sharing those for us. We've got just a couple minutes. Mary had added a few things that IGC, IJC has done, um, raising and distributing COVID money and raising money for scholarships. Y'all were able to give out your first round. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you do want to be added to the mailing list, you can put your email in the chat box. Um, if you'd like to do that, we always send the speaker a list of all the comments, but um, Sarah had also put her email in as well. You're welcome to her email her to get put on the list. That'd Any other great. thoughts or questions for Sarah before we start to wrap up? I'll give you, it takes people a few seconds to find their mute button. So um, I'm I'll just offer a shameless plug since Mary brought up the fundraising for the scholarship committee. Um, we are in the middle of, or, or getting ready to do a end of year scholarship fundraising push for both the scholarships as well as the COVID relief fund. Um, Mary's being humble. Mary was involved very, very much with the scholarships for last year. Um, and we have had a student group at App State that's collected money this year um, for scholarships, but we certainly, we, I, Mary, we gave out 2,500 or was it $3,500 of scholarships this year? We gave out about $3,500 or $3,600 uh, distributed um, to five students in varying amounts kind of based on um, the, you know, the quality of their uh, application and that kind of thing. So we hope to expand that. Yeah. And we've, like I said, we've partnered with a student group at App State called Students Supporting Immigrants and Refugees, who's done a lot of fundraising. Um, but, and we've also given out, um, and I, you know, I think this is something, this is one of those moments where I'm going to be proud of the fact that we've done, we've worked really hard this year to try to provide COVID relief. Um, to this date, I think we've collected and distributed about $23,000 yeah. to over 50 families in the high country, um, which is not nothing, especially considering that we're not a nonprofit. So people were making these donations without any, you know, tax relief or tax you know, break. Um, but we are looking at trying to figure out how we can we can start collecting donations and give people some tax credit if that's something they're interested in. But we are very fortunate and and just unbelievably humbled by the generosity of our community. We had people who literally handed over their entire COVID relief check because there was the realization that our Latinx immigrant neighbors are not getting any kind of COVID relief. They do not qualify. Even the families who have American born children do not qualify. So my family got extra money because we have two minor children, but undocumented parents who have minor children who are US citizens did not get anything. Um, and they are often families who, you know, are already sort of living paycheck to paycheck or sort of, um, insecure income anyway. So to add the stress of COVID on top of that has been a tremendous um, stressor for a lot of families. So we've been able to help pay rent, electric, water bill, internet, so that kids can remain connected. The other thing I'll say that Sarah spearheaded was to raise money for um, the family of a young boy in our community who died to pay for the funeral and to transport his um, body back to, um, his mother in Central America, mm -hmm. I, I believe. Yeah. And the community uh, has been so responsive to these efforts. It's just amazing. Well, we appreciate what y'all are doing and um, the information. And um, Sarah, I feel like we could have you back in the spring that we only let you speak a drop about all the stuff that you could have shared with us. So it's one o'clock. I'm going to wrap us up because people have places to be. But um, Sarah, thank you. You're the I'm holding up a book. If you do nothing else as follow up, please read this book. It's so good. Um, it's on the reading list that I shared. So if you didn't already get that, it's called The Death and Life of Ada Hernandez, A Border Story. Um, it is so spectacularly written about a true story um, and it is fantastic. And then there's one more, I'm sorry, Enrique's Journey. If you haven't read this one, this is an older book, um, but Enrique's Journey is fantastic. And I think people find that, find it very relevant 
in North Carolina because ultimately Enrique ends up in North Carolina. That's his his ultimate destination. He's trying to reunite with his mother, um, and he ends up in North Carolina. And it and there's a website actually if you're interested to know. The, the story doesn't end with the book. There's a website where you can get follow up from Enrique and his family. And you know, spoiler alert, it's not good. Um, it's not it's not a happy ending necessarily, but it's a very real story. And I think that both of these are true stories and, and very important to have that perspective from people. Thanks, Sarah. I'm gonna copy the chat and email it to you so you can see some of the comments you may not have had time to read. Thank you. And I appreciate so much you being time with us, spending time with us, your energy and enthusiasm for this work. And um, just a quick note to everybody on the call that we won't have Wednesday conversations the next two weeks because of the holidays. So I'll send that out by email as well. Thanks, Mary, for your contributions as well. Hope y'all have a good rest of the day. Stay safe. The roads are bad. I hope everybody has safe travels and um, hope to see you in January. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. Have a good day. You too. Is it okay if I stop the recording? Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I always go to make the email, make sure I 